Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, and we will go ahead and, uh, and get started. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here for the kickoff event for 2011 Global Entrepreneurship Week and DC Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, my name is Jeff Reed. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Initiative here at Georgetown. We're thrilled to be here for today's event. Now, starting today, in 123 countries around the world, millions of current and aspiring entrepreneurs will be kicking off the third annual Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, more than 25,000 partner organizations will host 40,000 events and a week-long celebration that will drive awareness and adoption for the world's key economic driver, entrepreneurship. Here in Washington, D.C., D.C. Entrepreneurship Week kicked off this morning and will continue throughout the week with hundreds of events, uh, well, dozens of events, hundreds of entrepreneurs learning, networking, pitching their ideas, and all uh, in the spirit of driving our entrepreneurship economy locally. And right here on the Georgetown University campus, we celebrate the beginning of our third year of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative. This initiative started two years ago this fall and continues to grow in its reach and in its scope. Our ultimate goal is for Georgetown to be well known for its entrepreneurial culture and its entrepreneurial community, to be known as a place that supports and encourages entrepreneurship, to be known in essence as a campus-sized incubator where students, faculty, staff, and alumni all come together and build a better entrepreneurial future. We solve problems in ways that build value for themselves and for society. You know, one of our newest programs uh, launched earlier this fall is the Entrepreneur in Residence program. Through our EIR program, we bring experienced entrepreneurs to campus on a regular basis. They're tasked with acting as mentors and advisors to students interested in entrepreneurial careers. They participate on our expert panel as part of our Pitch Jack program, where students pitch their entrepreneurial ideas every other Friday afternoon. Uh, they serve as guest speakers, competition judges, curriculum advisors, and they just help us out in a whole lot of different ways. So we're proud to have our entrepreneurs in residence here on a panel tonight. Uh, I'm going to now introduce them and invite them to come forward for the first part of our program. Uh, first, I'll invite Timothy Keenan. Tim is president and chairman, or has been uh, recently, of High Performance Technologies, Inc. And uh, Tim will tell you a little bit about his story behind that company. And uh, well, let me, let's invite Tim Keenan. Come on up, Tim. <laughs> Alyssa Lovegrove had founded a company in England years ago. She's been a uh, consultant and is now the founder of New Venture Mentors, which is a nonprofit incubator for young adult entrepreneurs around the DC area. Alyssa Lovegrove. And Susan Wilson, who has founded, uh, years ago, was part of the founding team of Live Print, which became part of Kinkos.com. Since then, she's uh, done a number of things, including founding FundHer, which is a social entrepreneurial venture that leverages crowdfunding to directly fund female entrepreneurs. Thank you, Susan Wilson. All right, now I'm gonna sit down here with him and ask him a couple of questions. So, there we go, all right. So we'll just start here with Tim and we'll go on down. Um, just tell us a little bit about your own entrepreneurial story and some of the key lessons learned. Well, I started uh, interest in business like anybody else, newspapers, lemons, lemonade stand, all that. When I got to college, I found I didn't have enough money to finish. My brother and I started a business. Um, some of you are familiar with college hunks hauling junk. Well, we were wee haul. Uh, my brother and his friends are all weightlifters and powerlifters and very big people, uh, so I hired them as the labor. And what we did is haul junk uh, from the local manufacturing uh, around the Columbus area. Uh, and that got us started, actually paid for 10 quarters of education between my brother and I. So it was very successful uh, until, you know, when you start a business, you really should understand the rules of, of the game, both the official ones and the unofficial ones. In my case, the unofficial ones are that I was replacing union labor with non-union labor. 
uh, and got a visit from a very large person uh, who explained to me how that was not, just not done. And I happen to agree with him, mostly because he weighed about 300 pounds. He's very, very persuasive. He was, he was an articulate young man. <laughs> uh, the bulge in his pocket got my real attention. But, so it did, did get my juices flowing. And then when I, uh, when I got out, um, uh, I was in the Marine Corps for a short period of time uh, watching systems that didn't work in the field. And when I came back, I was looking for ways to make that work. Uh, I, I just thought it was not right that our warfighters had systems that weren't working for them, given that this country should be putting out the top technology there is. And when I did look into it, I found there were design problems in most of the systems. It wasn't a manufacturing issue. So um, I started looking into where that happens. That happens in supercomputer systems, particularly in large uh, models and design functions. And uh, when I looked into that market, I found that there were no companies in the market. There were an awful lot of universities, a lot of labs. Uh, but no company. So we brought a business model to a space that didn't have a business model. And we started um, being able to bring solid architecture skills, design skills, and uh, we sort of dominated the market to the point where the company grew to 500 people, about $115 million, which I, as Jeff noticed, I just sold here in July. Um, and that is a painful process if anybody's been through it. It's like selling your child. <laughs> And now I get to watch them make my child ugly. <laughs> but uh, all worked out very well. You have, you have something to console you. That's uh, that, that wire transfer. Uh, the, wi the wire transfer never hurts, but it generally goes from there to here to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and Uncle Sam takes his bite, too, I'm uh, sure. Yes. He bites hard. All right. Well, that's a good, good introduction. Thank you, Tim. Alyssa, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial story. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, um, actually, I started my career not necessarily as an entrepreneur. I um, uh, was aimed more at the sort of traditional corporate route. I started out as a banker, as Jeff said, um, uh, for a few years, and then I went into strategy consulting. Um, but after, I guess, 10 or 12 years, had the idea that uh, I wanted to do something a bit more hands-on. Um, and uh, looking back on it now, I realized that um, the, the, the banking and the consulting was actually fabulous preparation. But in any case, I had this idea that I wanted to do something that I could really um, wrap my arms around and uh, trolled around for a couple of ideas, eventually landed on one that uh, seemed to have some traction, which was a uh, mail order catalog company selling stuff for kids, uh, baby and toddler products, um, toys and recreational equipment, uh, home furnishings, a whole range of things, but all aimed at kids. Um, we, um, and, and as Jeff mentioned, this was in, uh, in London, in England, where I was living at the time. Um, it was um, uh, great fun, uh, at least to start, um, and uh, in fact took off a lot. Well, we had in mind that it would really be more of, a, I, I say we, I had a, a partner that I uh, worked with. She was a lawyer, I was a consultant. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, neither of us had any hands-on retail experience, but um, anyway, we were, we were bold. We went for it. We thought we had a good product concept, concept and I think we found that we did. Um, I, I think as well, it was also a great uh, example of right place at the right time. Uh, mail order catalog marketing was a relatively underdeveloped, unsaturated market in London at the time, uh, even though specialty catalogs were very much the norm uh, here in the US. So we took an idea that we knew probably could work. The channel was growing. Um, the, the product range was, was a bit distinctive. And the thing really did take off. Um, we ran it for about 10 years, uh, sold it to a group of private equity investors. Um, and coincidentally, I ended up moving to Washington about a year later. So um, that, for the moment, was the end of that entrepreneurial experience. It was a fascinating learning experience, I think. Um, to answer your question, lessons learned. I think a couple of a couple of things, um, and and the most important one was probably uh, this: that um, we were very reluctant to take on external investors uh, earlier on in the business than we did. And there's never a right answer to that question, but I I do regret looking back on it now that we didn't invite uh, other investors in earlier. I think we could have grown even faster, and I think we would have had a little bit more cushioning uh, against some of the risks that we encountered um, as we progressed. So um, it's easy to say in hindsight. At the time, we were very concerned about you know 
well, you know, if we have anybody else involved, you know, we're not in control, and you know, all that's true, and that's the trade-off. Um, but uh, I think it would have allowed us to take take advantage of some opportunities that we didn't have a chance to pursue. So, thank that. you very much, Susan. Tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial story. You know, I I didn't start out as an entrepreneur. I'm actually a graduate of Georgetown. Um, I was in this business school, and I'm a CPA that's never practiced public accounting. Started out my career at Marriott, and um, you know, I think the thing that made me an entrepreneur was I grew up in the 70s, um, and my mom stayed with my father, frankly, because she didn't have a choice. Um, and I saw a lot of my friends that way. Eventually, the dynamic changed, and they're still married today. But long story short, I made sure I always I, I had my own money. I, I vowed I would never rely on a man to support me financially. Um, and <laughs> the irony of that is I've gotten a man that I can never rely on financially. Um, I've been married 20 years, and I have to be an entrepreneur because I don't think I could make the money to support him and our three kids otherwise. Um, so the first startup I did um, after Marriott, um, I went and picked my one son up from daycare and the, the woman, it was a Friday afternoon, I remember this, and I, you know, I drove to DC and you know, I didn't spend enough time with my children and she insisted something was wrong, he was sick, and she proceeded to tell me that she spent more time with him than I did and that she knew better. And so it was that weekend that I quit my job at Marriott and decided I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but um, immediately started consulting, went to work for, um, ran a law firm for a while, and one of the partners there, her husband, uh, wanted to start a tech company. And I was the finance person, he was the tech guy. Um, unlike Alyssa, we knew we wanted to raise venture money. Um, we landed on the printing space, immediately went out, this was 98, 1998, went out and raised $2 million from Flatiron Partners. And if anybody knows, Fred Wilson was one of the partners there, and he's at Union Square Ventures now. So um, got really lucky. Uh, we did a strategic deal with Kinko's, became Kinko's.com, and the intention was to take the dot-com public because Kinko's was a privately held entity at the time. Um, and it was an amazing ride. I, you know, I can remember my 30th birthday, and, and it was just this amazing thing. We were on the floor of the exchange, um, and then the market collapsed. Um, and while I wouldn't trade it for the world, uh, the reality is we ended up selling to Kinko's for $100 million, and the bulk of that money went to, um, we raised $2 million from uh, Flatiron, but we went on to raise another $10 million from Chase Capital. So the bulk of the money went to the investors. Um, and, but it's still, it's this bug that, you know, one of the lessons is that it's, I think it's almost like a drug. I, I've not done certain drugs. I've done some, but not certain drugs. <laughs> they say you chase this high that you can never repeat again. And that first one, I would tell you, that first one is so incredible. So make sure, and that's why I'd say do it as early as possible, because if you can go all in and not worry about kids and spouses and, you know, you can be selfish and focus on the entity, um, those are things nobody told me, and I wish I had done it sooner. Um, so from there, I took a year off, um, licked my wounds, took up meditation and yoga, um, mm -hmm. and decided I'd start another company and not raise venture capital. Um, I discovered that people are, um, by definition, self-interested. Um, it's not a character flaw. It is a natural part of our DNA. It's how we survive. And so I built a company. Um, I wanted to take data and turn it into cash. I didn't want to trend it or anything like that. I literally wanted to take it, data and turn it into cash with no people and have it purely automated. Um, I landed on judgments randomly. Um, one person sues another in court, and they get a court judgment, say it's $5,000. Um, 80% of those are never paid. So in the US, there's a trillion dollars in unpaid judgments right now. So all we have to do is locate where somebody banks, works, or owns property, you file a form with the court, and then the checks come. So it's, not, it's, um, it's an interesting model, and my exit strategy has been very different with that one. I self-funded, um, ended up raising some friends and family, but um, that's one I want to keep um, because it spits off cash. Um, so, so it kind of runs itself these days, and I went on to start Funder. Um, and that's just the kind of a hobby. And um, I, I, one of the lessons, I've, I've done some things here at Georgetown, but I'm curious, if I held up a, a $100 bill and said, who wants it? First person down here gets it. <laughs> Do you notice, I've got three as a matter of fact. Do you notice not one woman moved? Do you notice that? The guys jumped over the chair, not one <laughs> woman And that moved. wasn't staged. My phone went somewhere. <laughs> you, you, I'm sure you'll find it. It's over there. I'm sure a girl, <laughs> look, I'm sure a girl will pick it up and hand it to you. Look how kind she is. <laughs> Thanks. But that's, you're welcome. But, so these are the things that fascinate me, and this is why I started Funder. Um, 
You know, and it's, you know, I get beat up. They're not, they're not scientific, it's more social, but I'm not kidding you, not one woman moved. And, and so, I, I, you know, one day I'd like to continue the dialogue because I'm curious why not. Look, she's saying he was closer. All right, here's $20, who wants it? She moved that time. But, we, I mean, we can go on and on, but it was only because we engaged one-on-one -on -one that she ended up moving. So. It, all those things, you can't be an entrepreneur if you're afraid of money. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm still afraid of money. I, I hate to ask for money, I, you know, and I think women have this bad rap that we're um, afraid to ask for money, that we're lousy negotiators, and I think all that's crap. Frankly, I think we invented the art of negotiation. We can manipulate the shit out of anything to get our way. Um, we just don't call it negotiating. You know, we're amazing advocates for others. So if there's a way to flip the model, I think there's some interesting things to be done. So that's what I've been doing with Funder, um, and I don't exclude men from it because I, it fascinates, you're part of the ecosystem, so it fascinates me. Um, and I appreciate you guys, you know, just doing you and you that know, was great. proving the model. Yeah, I've, I've heard, as Susan and I have talked about this experiment before, this is my first time seeing it in action, and it proved pretty true, didn't it? Isn't it fascinating? <laughs> that was amazing. Well, and, and a lot of what you were saying does lead into the next question I was gonna ask, and that's, uh, what are some of the things that each of you are now doing to help aspiring entrepreneurs? And uh, just tell us about that. It was a little bit of everything since now we have more time, but uh, I took a good deal of my proceeds and opened a charitable foundation, um, predominantly for at-risk youth, um, so that they can have a path in life, uh, which allows them choices. So I start there. Uh, this program, Entrepreneur in Residence, is just about being able to talk to, to you all. Uh, which is important to sit down and talk to you about your ideas and show you how to get maybe that, that head start. Um, I also uh, am starting here in January. Uh, I'll be teaching an entrepreneurship class here at Georgetown, the second in a series. So I hope that allows us to give back. But just being able to, to talk to young entrepreneurs and, and maybe take away some of the fear that if I had somebody telling me things, uh, or advising me to take the money, you know, the, uh, the trade-off between power and such isn't as big a trade-off as you think. A long time ago, the founder of SCIC told me he'd rather have 1% of a billion dollars than 100% of 100, okay? Yeah, well, he's, he's a guy who died a very rich man. <laughs> uh, that was the largest uh, employee-owned stock option program in the, in the world. So he built a model that basically created entrepreneurship inside a very large uh, structure. So I, I like seeing those sort of things. Uh, well, what I'm doing now, let's see. Uh, well, it's, it's a relatively easy question for me to uh, answer. I, I think I mentioned um, uh, earlier, uh, I, I had the opportunity to move to Washington not long after I sold my business. And so I also had the opportunity to think about how to use the experience uh, in a new setting. And uh, one of the things that I, uh, I guess, fixed on, uh, or one of the questions that really started to, to fascinate me was, there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and innovation as, you know, the engine of economic prosperity, and you know, um, it, you know, it's a very, it's a very hot topic at the moment. Um, and there's also a lot of talk, especially here in the in the greater Washington area, about um, the economic divide and the fact that both geographically and demographically, there are large parts of the population who don't seem to be able to um, participate in that uh, prosperity. Uh, and, and even over the last 20 years, when there's been you know, enormous uh, growth and change in the, in, the, um, in the complexion of Washington, there are still big parts of the population that haven't participated in that. But it's a separate dialogue. You know, there's this, this uh, dialogue about you know, creating wealth in underserved communities, and it's separate from the dialogue about entrepreneurship. And so what's been fascinating me lately is how do you connect those two conversations? How do you take the entrepreneurial talent and the capital that's been generated and start to put that to work in some of these communities? And, and by communities, I mean both geographically and demographically, parts of the city and, and um, populations within this area that haven't really been able to access that. Um, so what, what we did, uh, myself and a few other people, is. Um, just take a stab at trying to understand it better. We created a fund called New Venture Mentors, which is really a combination of a, of a seed fund and a network of mentors, uh, all experienced entrepreneurs, um, 
with an interest in, in, in sharing their experience and their talent. And we try and match them up. Um, and um, it's, uh, so, so that's the idea, to try and, and, and um, bring talent to those communities and also make it easy for people with that talent to connect with those communities. Um, it's a journey. We've only been at it for about 18 months now. Um, and uh, we're, we're learning as much uh, about the uh, situation, I think, as anything. You know, we're learning that um, it's, um, first of all, it's, um, it's easy to say you want to um, provide the support, but it's not so easy. It sounds, sounds odd, but it's not as easy as it sounds finding people who are uh, interested and in a position where they can really take advantage of that. And that's been one of our challenges. The other thing, Jeff uh, mentioned it earlier, we've been targeting um, young adults by and large, um, people under 30 or 35, uh, which sounds like a good idea, but one of the things we've also discovered is that um, to be an entrepreneur, you need to have had some, some other prior business experience, in my view, uh, that there's a lot of judgment that comes from having been in a business environment. And if you haven't had the opportunity uh, to see it in action, um, it's that much harder to succeed as an entrepreneur. So those are some of the things that we're currently wrestling with. Um, I'm, uh, it, it's a topic that fascinates me. I'm more than interested to hear from people who have views on, on how we can do this more effectively and want to join in and help, so. Excellent. Well, Susan, is there anything more in, about Fund Her or other things, maybe some of the things you're doing here at Georgetown that you want to talk about? Uh, you know, th there are amazing training and mentoring programs. I think I, I disagree with you know, some of the other panelists in that I think you should do it without the business experience to a certain degree because I think um, you'll learn as you grow. And failure, like it or not, is part of the process. And so when you're young, it's okay to fail. There's less risk. Um, so if, if you're open to the counseling and the stuff that's available, you should be okay, you know, be willing to ask for help. Um, Funder is not about training or mentoring. It really is about directly funding, uh, at this point, female entrepreneurs in the U.S. Um, there isn't anything, and it's focused on crowdfunding. Um, at this point, we're raising money and just kicking off a campaign, um, and the idea is to uh, go out and raise $1, uh, go to a million people to raise a dollar or more, and then invest roughly $50,000 in female-led startups and see what happens, I, you saw here. I have absolutely no idea what that means and, and there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Um, and that's why crowdfunding works because the, you know, it's kind of loosey-goosey and that's what drives me. Um, but you know, I, I think that asking questions is what is particularly interesting, uh, what is, is what interests me. So um, if you guys have any ideas, um, I'd, you know, I'd love to hear them. You know, any new experiments or anything like that or just random ideas, thoughts. Throw them out, just tweet at funder, F-U-N-D-H-E-R, um, or email me. Um, I really am fascinated by, I, I, I didn't expect three guys to jump over the chairs. Like that, <laughs> you know, those are the things you can't, you, don't, you can't make that stuff up. And, and you know, it's just interesting to me. Oh, that's great. And, uh, and you've seen, she's, she's proven she's willing to put money out, so. Yeah, that's my, that's <laughs> my money, by the way. The money we raise from crowdfunding, 100% directly funds female entrepreneurs. Well, you guys have all touched on this, and I'll ask generally, kind of, do you have general advice for aspiring entrepreneurs. And uh, it could be from your own experience or anything else. I know all of you have been talking to a lot of our entrepreneurs, our student entrepreneurs over the last couple of months here. Is there anything that's come across that you, you know, some questions that you've seen that, that you can generally uh, talk about now or uh, anything you've learned from your own experience that you think is important for this audience? Well, I personally have talked to a lot of these young people and they all have the same thing. They're kind of alone. Uh, and they don't know how to partner up for the skill they don't have. Uh, they always ask us a lot of questions. How do I get a programmer to build this? How do I get somebody to help me with that? The reality is they want to find somebody and partner, but until they partner, they actually have to know themselves. So I really think they need to spend more time introspection on what are my core values? What do I believe in? Because until you know who you are, you can't uh, assess what kind of partner would work with you in a model. Because when the two of you get together, that is the start of the company culture. And to me, the company culture is what decides whether you will live or die. Um, if you can build that culture such that it's a, a nurturing culture and a service model, and you're going to attract people to it, then you will grow almost regardless of your financial skills or the technical, what you're doing. You will get to where you're going. But if you don't build the skills, which is a tool of how to do introspection, 
so that you can know yourself, not how you want to be known, but how you really are, what's inside of you. Because that's what you will do when push comes to shove and you're at a decision point in your company. That's what will come out in your decisions, whatever is truly your core values. Not what you thought they should be, because there's core values out there for a lot of firms, right? You know, my example to most of my people I teach is, is uh, respect, integrity, commitment, and excellence. Those are fine core values, don't you think? Those are Enrons, okay? So they're fine, core, <laughs> they're fine core values, and they spent $26 million seeking through their whole company for the core values, but they did it with the wrong thing in heart, which is the core values to those top people were for someone else. Not for them to live by, but for their employees to live by. Okay, so then when it came down to making a very key decision, they went the wrong way. So you have to build that skill and you have to constantly do it all through your business life. Good, any other advice? Well, one of the questions that um, I've been asked a lot lately, uh, especially since we've started working with students here, is, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time helping students think about business plans, either for business ideas that they, you know, have, have generated or for coursework. Or a lot of times people say, well, you know, do you really need a plan? And what's a good plan? And, you know, how important is it? And I, I, probably all of us, you know, here have, have a different view on that. Um, I actually think a plan is very important, or at least it was very helpful to me. But the reason is, is perhaps not the one you think. I think a plan is a living document. Um, and I, I think uh, it's, it's not just a marketing document, it's actually a guide to how you're gonna run the business. I suppose my view is, you know, a, a new concept, the concept is obviously very important, uh, and, and the ability to generate the ideas and to find a niche that nobody is exploiting. But I think equally important is to have a really good, clear idea in your own mind of what it looks like when it's, when it's out there, when it's real, and the more detailed you can be in that vision, the more likely you are to, to get there. Now, having said that, you know, the, the outcome is never what you wrote in the plan. It's never what you wrote in the plan. The whole, the key to it is that it is, as I said, a living document, that you know, you, you've, got, you've got a blueprint, but you amend it as you learn more about you know, what's out there, what works, what doesn't. Um, but it gives you something to, to, to measure yourself by and to, to keep you and your team. I mean, you know, for me, it was a way of keeping all of us uh, on track. Great, thank you. Um, I would agree about the business plan in that it, it forces clarity on your perspective. Um, having written business plans and they're just, honestly, you know, the numbers, the economics, I've built financial models all day long and they're lies. I don't care what anybody says. They're best wish for, We call those for. assumptions. Yeah, they're, <laughs> you know, they, like it or not, the reality is they are. It, and it's not intentional, it's not a bad thing, it's just part of the process. And today, technology is so cheap and the price to play in the game of entrepreneurship has just dropped so dramatically. You're not gonna get funding until they say, um, give us you know, a working prototype. Get, prove that you can get clients, prove that you can get traction. And so I'd almost say where you start isn't where you end up anyways. So get something live, duct tape it together, find a way to, to get something out there. And, and, and you know, it's a, it used to be called a trial balloon, whatever. I'm not saying lie, cheat, or steal. I'm just saying prove the market's there because the reality is, People don't necessarily um, behave like they think, like you think they do, or like they say they do. You know, watch what people actually do. Um, and, and so, I'd say a, a quick and dirty business plan is great. Don't spend three weeks on it. You sp spend those three weeks. You know, spend a week and get something live, and then spend another week to get customers and see what works. Don't take it too seriously that early, because I think that wastes a lot of time, and you can save yourself um, from failing big. Fail. Tiny failures along the way. So, so Tim, I know you, I've heard you speak before about ethics, and this came up from a couple of folks here. What do you think is important to know as an entrepreneur when it comes to ethics? Here we are at Georgetown. I think ethics is a very important part of everything we do here. And uh, what lessons would you impart on folks around entrepreneurial ethics? Well, first a little bragging on why you asked me. <laughs> Thank you for the softball. Uh, my company won the American Business Ethics Award, which is the national award for business ethics. Now, to get that little piece of glass means nothing, but to be able to turn around to your employees and tell them that we've been assessed as the most ethical firm in America uh, is a big deal because we're government contractors, and we've heard it all. Slimy contractor, beltway bandit, all the things they called our industry. 
it was insulting to my people. So we went to prove that our processes and procedures were the most ethical, so that our people could commit fully. They didn't have to hold back that last 10%. So it has a huge productivity mission to your company. But it still goes back to, it sits on top of core values, right? And core values need processes and procedures to be implemented throughout your firm. It's also, I can't be everywhere giving my speech every employee, right? I can give them this, and then all the processes and procedures implement those ethics. So that when they are out at a field site and someone asks them to do something that they just know I would not approve of, they make the right decision. And they know that the company will completely back them up, including when they turn down business because it's the wrong kind of business. All business is not good business, you know, because you will pay forever for making those. There's a saying in our industry anyway that you get to sell your ethics once and the beltway is round meaning everybody knows. When you take the shortcut, everybody in your industry, any industry you go into, is a small little world. And we all know each other in our industry. So when you take the shortcut, we all know that you are not somebody we can do business with, ever. So you gotta think through that as to, it is good business, good ethics are good business, because it allows all the other good people in your industry to know who to seek out to do business and partner with. And that's, we wanted to build that as the foundation because you don't build it in from the beginning. It doesn't show up later. You can't decide later to be ethical. You need to start that way and build it into the DNA of all the people you hire and how you rate them for promotion and who gets bonuses and all the steps in a business decision. If you build that into the, into the DNA of your company, you're never gonna get one of those phone calls that we all dread from a customer saying, you not so nice person. You know, we don't really need any of that stuff in a business. Those are all negative distractions. So if you can, if you can build this in, then your people know what to expect from you. They know what you expect when they go outward. And you will not have any of the negative events that you've seen destroy businesses just in, in your time frame. You watched Enron go down. Enron, you know, put almost 11,000 very good people out of work, including my brother. You know, they put, uh, you know, WorldCom here in the local area, fine company, went down for the same ethical mismanagement. You watch the banking scandal here just in the last few years. These are all people that forgot to make decisions on the right criteria. So. That's great. You guys want to add anything to that? That was pretty strong. That was strong. You know, I, yeah. I think for, for me, I, my dilemma with ethics is, there isn't always clearly this one answer. I, at Live Print Kinko's, when it became you know this big thing, um, I grew up. My mom taught me you know you can be anything you want to be and do the right thing and you know good things happen to good people and everything happens for a reason. And you go down this path and the reality is people have different obligations and fiduciary duties and they sometimes don't align. Um, investors, you know, you may not make payroll and you're going to lose your you know half your staff. Your investors could give you $20,000 to save it, but their, fiduciary, their obligation is to their shareholders, and so they can't. And, and so you're like, God, it'd be so easy. Or they have their own money. There, there's all these shades of gray that aren't necessarily ethics, but it was kind of this loss of innocence. And I think there, and, and I thought, like I said, I took a year off to lick my wounds because I thought they were bad. They were the bad guys, because clearly I knew I was a good guy, you know? Um, and it took a, a while to realize that, you know, um, you need to understand and give people the grace um, to do their jobs as well and kind of remember what their obligations are. Well, I think at this point we're going to turn it over to our audience for some questions. We've got a couple of microphones here, so don't be, sh don't be shy. Um, Susan might offer money to the first question. I, I can't, I don't know for sure. There you go. 20 bucks. Who wants to ask a question? <laughs> Thank you. Rock on, we got a girl. Okay. Hi, I'm just curious. Um, I would love to be an entrepreneur myself. But I'm wondering, what kind of business plan do you really need? How many pages does that need to be? Should it say revenues and expenses? Or I have no idea where to start. I, think I guess, I guess I, that one landed to me. I stuck myself out for that, didn't I? You know, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. And, and I, I think the point I, I try to make is um, the plan is, is just a guide. 
it's, it's, it's a, a place to start to define you know, where you're headed. And it's going to continue to change. And the level of depth isn't so much the issue as much as it is the clarity. Now, different people probably have different, uh, it probably depends it on who is the audience. secondary to the idea, though. Yeah. I mean, is yeah. it a good idea before you waste any time on a business put, plan? Put your energy in the concept and all the boilerplate that goes behind it. I think you heard we all agree with Susan on what the financial model's worth. Mm -hmm. okay, I've never yeah. seen yeah. a uh, first year revenue estimate that I thought was yeah. anything <laughs> other than humorous. Uh, so. But having having said that, I will I will add one thing, which is I think the, the the risk of taking that advice too much to heart is make sure you do know where the money is. Though I mean, your own mind, make sure you know what the what what are the the things about the concept that are going to generate money. Okay. I just yeah. like to point out, you see how all three of these guys just light up and start giving feedback. <laughs> this is exactly what our entrepreneurs and residents are here for, and I think that part of the answer is it it depends on your idea and what you're going for. Uh, my advice is. Come to one of our uh, one of our programs. We have two that might be a good for you. The first one I'd recommend is is called Entrepreneurial Chalk Talk, Talk, starting this Wednesday, where our entrepreneurs and residents are going to have just basically office hours, uh, Wednesdays at five o'clock, and uh, so you can come and ask more in-depth questions and get more and more feedback. And uh, then we have another one every other Friday. We call Pitch Jack. Once you have a plan, yeah, come down, come down and get the money you earn. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so we ha we have programs to get you more more and more advice around these questions. So we have time for maybe one more question. Right. One, one more thing. So you want to pay attention to your cash flow model, not your revenue projections. Okay. <laughs> I always take that you know, closest to the money line. Yeah. That's how my husband. He doesn't understand cash flow or anything like that, but it's closest to the that, money line. Where's it coming in? Where's it going out? Period. That's sacred to a small business. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. So I just had a. Thank you for being here, by the way. Um, my name is Mark. I'm here with the Georgetown program, um, MBA program. My question is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot like a lot of people in this room. I have a lot of ideas. Um, I feel like I get one every minute, and I sort of got into a habit of writing them into a journal and kind of just trying to stack them. And now it's at a point where it's an overwhelming number of ideas. And I look at it, and I'm like, wow, I would, I would love to know how to figure out how to prioritize these, which ones make the most amount of sense, which ones are really just terrible, terrible ideas. Um, I guess my question is, is I, I've actually signed up for Pitch Jack this Friday. It's going to be awesome. I hope everyone can make it. 1 um, o'clock, Friday, 1 o'clock, room 150, right around the corner. You can see Mark in action. Yeah, I, I got you. Um, so my question is, is you know, I'm sure you all come from a similar background where you have these ideas and you can't wait to make them happen. My, my favorite ones are ones that require an amazing amount of investment and they're products that are going to require lots of money, lots of time. Um, just some advice if you have any for someone like me who really is trying to prioritize how to get, wh which ideas to act on, which ideas probably should stay back there in that, that journal, <laughs> and uh, you know, how, how to discern what makes the most amount of sense to, to move forward with. Well, I also had a journal, and I built a checklist for myself that was separate from the journal, because I didn't want to build a checklist that made one idea look good, <laughs> which was the thing that you'll probably be doing. So you need to step back and maybe get some friends' advice. But you know, each idea has, has components to it, right? The industry you're in, the idea, whether you're trying to do something better or you're trying to do something new. So are you trying to create a market in one of your ideas, or are you trying to create market share in one of your ideas? I would put them in those, sort, sort your ideas just to two categories. You know, it's kind of like the old advice, how do you approach infinity? Well, you cut it in half, right? Eventually, you know, you'll never get there. So you have to start getting it in some idea. Then there's, you'll find yourself enjoying reading a list, one of those two lists more. Which means you're, you're going to be this kind of person that likes to build a new market that's never been done, or this kind of person that wants to prove to the world you know how to do it better. Okay, so this is a very competitive model. This is more you like the newness. So I think you'll find you can cut your list in half by just making those two. Then I would take whichever one you end up with. And frankly, if I'm in the market side, well, then I have to do some real quick Google searching and figure out if someone else is already there. I'll guarantee someone else is already in some aspect of your idea. See if the market's accepting, right? Because one of those ideas might be already been rejected by the marketplace, and you can maybe lower the priority. On the market share side, you know, the market's full of things that, that create efficiencies, right? And that's where most entrepreneurs create their businesses. Right? All right. Thank you. I'm going gonna, gonna to have to cut it off because uh, we got to move on. You can create, that's a whole business in and of itself, to throw ideas up and let yep. people rate them. We'll yep. talk after.
So yes, these guys are going to be around. Let's uh, let's thank our panel. They're here. They're in residence. <laughs> and uh, thank you. You guys can drop those mics off. And they. Uh, so yes, they're not they're not just here for one day. They're here uh, all all the time. Not necessarily every single day, but you definitely have access to them and their advice. Uh, so now we're going to move to the next part of our program. And, uh, and, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean David Thomas, who's going to introduce our next speaker. You know, I don't consider myself a real hardcore entrepreneur. I work for university. I get a salary. I, I did take a small risk when I came here a couple of years ago because I, uh, I came to work for our previous dean, uh, who was a great supporter of entrepreneurship. But I knew he wasn't going to be here forever. And, uh, and I was risking that our next dean would support entrepreneurship just as much. Well, in this case, my risk paid off. I uh, could not be happier. We have a wonderful leader for the business school and a great dean who supports entrepreneurship. It's my pleasure to introduce Dean David Thomas. Well, thank you. Um, how's everybody doing? Well, Good? Great. This is a great event. Uh, it's, and it's my pleasure to be part of this event uh, today and to welcome all of you to the McDonough School of Business. Uh, today we sit, we're here to celebrate entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is an important part of the McDonough School of Business and important to Georgetown University. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to hear from Jeff that his, uh, his experience of me around this topic is not that I've taken any step backwards from, from the direction that was set some time ago by my predecessor. Um, because I truly believe that uh, entrepreneurship must be part of the solution set that moves us out of the economic situation in which we find ourselves both domestically and globally. And uh, it's also critical to our curriculum here at the McDonough School of Business because what we really strive to do is to develop leaders who will be able to meet the most pressing challenges and opportunities facing business and society in the future. And in my view, that requires us to equip our students to be able to think as entrepreneurs, regardless of where they go to, to, to have their careers. So um, make no mistake about our commitment uh, in this area. And our students learn great lessons uh, in the entrepreneurship program here. Uh, and whether as interns, business consultants, or the founders of high growth companies like Blackboard, Living Social, and Monumental Sports, Georgetown students, faculty, and alumni are making a huge positive impact in the DC community. Georgetown has a long history of working with some of DC's most underprivileged residents including those east of the river. For example, Georgetown University has for over 20 years, through the Mayor Institute, helped hundreds of children in Ward 7 prepare for college, get accepted to college, and succeed while at college. And as our entrepreneurship initiative grows, we will dedicate ourselves to making an even greater impact because we believe that a strong Washington economy is important for our school's future success. And our commitment to DC is also why I'm particularly happy to introduce our next speaker, and that is Washington DC Mayor Vincent Gray. On January 2, 2011, Vincent Gray was sworn in as the sixth elected mayor of the District of Columbia. He was overwhelmingly elected on November, on November 2nd, 2010, garnering nearly 70% of the vote. During his campaign, he pledged to help unite the district by focusing on job creation, economic development, and a, collab a collaborative approach to school reform, safer streets in all neighborhoods, and restoring fiscal responsibility to, to city government. Vincent Gray has been a public servant for the people of DC for more than 30 years, and we thank him for his continued service. I am happy to introduce Georgetown's partner in the effort to create a better city and a fellow supporter of entrepreneurship, Washington DC Mayor Vincent Gray.
Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I think we have enough light in here? I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank you for such a very uh, nice introduction, Dean. Um, to, be, uh, to be here as a part of an effort like this um, really is reinforcing where we uh, hope to be able to go uh, as a city. Uh, and I want to thank Georgetown uh, for hosting uh, this event uh, here in conjunction with the university, in conjunction with the business school, and uh, to be able to host DC Entrepreneurship Week, as well as the uh, Global uh, Entrepreneurship uh, Week. I'm also delighted to be here with one of our uh, leading staff who is vested with the responsibility and the authority to be able to help move us forward and to convey the message that the District of Columbia is truly open for business. And that is David Zipper, who is the Director of Business Development and our Deputy Mayor for the uh, Planning and Economic Development in the District of Columbia. David, stand up and be recognized. <laughs> we like to think uh, that in these months, these, recent, these months, these almost, uh, well, 10 and a half months that we've been in office, that one of the messages that we have sent is that the District of Columbia truly is one of the best places uh, to be able to start a business and grow a business. Business of all shapes and all sizes, uh, especially for entrepreneurial ideas that may be innovative uh, and will take the District of Columbia in even uh, increasingly diverse areas. Um, <clears throat> one need only go to DuPont Circle, Columbia Heights, or H Street Northeast. Um, for those of you who are from somewhere else, you probably don't know much about those places. For those of you who are, who are from here, I would invite you, for example, to go out to H Street. Uh, what a phenomenal renaissance this uh, street has undergone. It's about a, I don't know, 12 or 15 block uh, area going from, U about Union Station, out another, you know, 12 or 15 blocks to 15th Street uh, Northeast. Um, 40 years ago, <clears throat> it was basically given up on because it was the site of where riots uh, had occurred in the District of Columbia, and actually was a neighborhood that I grew up in. Now, if you go out there, you will see an absolutely incredibly um, thriving um, and uh, rejuvenated uh, area uh, of the city. As a matter of fact, H Street was recently voted as the number one Main Street uh, in America, which we like to think is one of a, a real acknowledgement that it is a coming uh, part of the city and frankly, a coming part of um, our area. Uh, <clears throat> we have one of the most well-educated uh, and sophisticated workforces uh, in the uh, area, uh, maybe in the nation. Uh, in fact, the last statistic I looked at, 71% of the people who live in the District of Columbia have uh, some form of college education or a college degree. And I don't think there's any city uh, in the nation that can boast that. We. Um, have huge numbers of resources, and for those into technology, which I suspect is everybody in this room, we have actually grown. Our employment in the technology arena has grown by about 50 percent uh, since 2000. We have now, what, David, almost 23,000 people who are employed in technology jobs in the District of Columbia. We have literally hundreds of companies. I think there were, I don't know, 100 plus companies within the last year that have established themselves as technology firms uh, here in the District of Columbia. And we are working hard to be able to become a technology uh, incubator uh, site uh, here in the city. Um, how many, anybody in here familiar with St. Elizabeth's Hospital? That's the name of it. It is, it was, at one time it was the biggest uh, <clears throat> federally operated, actually. It was one of the biggest mental health facilities in the nation. They had 7,000 patients there back in the 60s uh, and early 70s. Uh, with the change in pharmacology, with the change in form of care, uh, with the change in treatment, um, like so many hospitals, it has shrunk down now to the point where we have one building, one hospital, where there are less than 300 patients who continue to be there, just on one side, one end of the campus which means that we now have acres and acres and acres uh, of property that is going to be developed over the next several years. And I think some of us, David, uh, his boss, the deputy mayor, Victor Hoskins, and I have come to the conclusion that wouldn't this be a great site for technology incubation uh, here in the District of Columbia, where we can help companies get started, 
They can grow their companies. They can hire employees. Of course, we hope they live in the District of Columbia and become a place where people from all over the nation uh, come to see how it's done uh, in technology. We, um, we like to think we have an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit here in the District of Columbia, and this is truly a changing era. There was a time for decades, decades, when the federal government was considered uh, to be the essential source of employment uh, here in the city. And frankly, we need only look at the federal budget challenges and see what's going on with the committee that's trying to make a, a trillion and a half reduction, over, reduction in the federal budget over the next 10 years to recognize that we're very unlikely to see any major increases in federal employment. And we're likely to, unlikely to see any major increases in federal investment uh, here in this city. And that's why we have kind of staked out for ourselves an investment in technology as we go forward. I was just talking to David a few minutes ago, and a year ago, uh, we had some who decried the uh, absence of district interest and district investment uh, in this particular arena. And I'd like to think that in the year 2011, David, that has changed, that we are a different city with a different level of interest and a different approach. One of the ways in which we're doing that is investing ourselves in the kind of education of our children that will produce more and more employees who are prepared for these jobs. Obviously, if a company locates here, they want to believe that there's an indigenous workforce uh, that is a available and capable of being able to uh, be hired for the jobs that they are increasingly uh, developing. We have now created, just opened uh, in um, August, a new STEM high school, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math high school, uh, 235,000 square feet. The H.D. Uh, Woodson High School, which is located on the east end of this city, which has been historically economically challenged. And we are going to be producing increasingly large numbers of students coming out of there, some of whom will be able to go to work right away, others of whom will go on to university uh, opportunities such as uh, those at Georgetown. We also just renovated another school, and we have created for the first time, I don't know whether this has exists in any other major cities in the country, um, since if nobody knows the answer, I'll take credit for it. Um, and that is an, a STEM education campus. We renovated the Langley School uh, here in the city. It is now a pre-K through eight STEM school. Right next door, within 20 or 30 feet, there is the McKinley High School, which is nine through 12. So we have a STEM concentration in these two schools in Northeast Washington that will serve literally hundreds uh, of students uh, this year and then literally thousands of students uh, in the years to come. Last week, we were host to the uh, Digital Capital Week. And for those of you who have not been involved in the, the absolute explosion, the burgeoning uh, industry and technology in the city, uh, you need to go to that. I, the, my, my recent exposure, my, not my most recent one, was I went to, uh, excuse me, to George Washington University. I apologize to the Georgetown students who are in there. I went to George Washington University's Lisner Auditorium. And by the way, I'm a graduate of George Washington, so I apologize li very lightly. <laughs> Um, they had a tech meetup there. What was it, the middle of September? And um, first of all, they do these on a monthly basis. There were 500 people in that auditorium uh, that night. One of the most astounding things was to listen to the presentations around apps that were being developed, apps that would do things like help you hail a cab, um, things that would help you prepare a meal, you know, all kinds of apps that are being developed some of which can be downloaded, obviously, for, for virtually nothing or, or for free. But also to hear people talk about the jobs that are available in the technology um, arena. At the end, the gentleman who was the, uh, the coordinator, the moderator for the night, uh, Pete Corbett, um, said, he asked, how many people in here are hiring? Half the hands in that room went up some 250 people, some of whom you know, represented firms that had anywhere from three to five to six jobs for which they were hiring. You know, and a quick little bit of math would tell you that that's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 jobs in the technology arena um, available uh, to people that night. And that's only going to grow. And we're gonna make sure that we continue to nurture that. 
because as we look at what the opportunities are for the growing economy in the District of Columbia, the rejuvenation of our economy in the District of Columbia, um, we see the technology arena as where that's going to happen. You see it all across the uh, city, Living Social, uh, which is uh, you know, the, the brainchild of Tim O'Shaughnessy, um, an absolutely phenomenal company that we're working hard to make sure they stay in, here in the District of Columbia. The, um, the other companies that are developed, like Blackboard, uh, for example, which has been around uh, for a while, and uh, Hello Wallet, which is uh, a newer firm that we're working hard to keep here in the District of Columbia. Frankly, if we don't seize upon this, we will have missed the opportunity and we will proverbially, anyway, be standing in the train station watching the train go down the track. We intend to be players in this, we intend to be aggressive, we intend to be involved, and we intend to work with those who want to be able to develop that kind of entrepreneurial direction uh, for themselves and for the District of Columbia. So David is going to be here. Uh, I invite you to uh, you know, leap all over him uh, when the reception comes this evening to talk to him about the opportunities. And yes, we do have incentives that are available uh, to people, uh, incentives that will help you uh, start your business, incentives that will help you grow your business. And we are creating an environment where we think people want to be in this city. We are one of the cities, few cities, that has actually grown in the last decade. We had 570,000 people who lived in the District of Columbia uh, in the year 2000. Today, based on the last census, we have 601,000 people who live in the District of Columbia. I was involved in a panel uh, the other day where someone suggested that with a real concerted effort, we could get to, in the not too distant future, having 800,000 to a million people uh, living in the District of Columbia. Now, there are probably some who would not necessarily want to live around all of those people. But I think we can do it in a convenient way, especially as we, if we start to think about changing our, changing our transportation uh, modalities, moving from automobiles to bicycles. We're going to bring a streetcar system to the city over the next uh, several years. Uh, we have a commitment to a 37-mile uh, streetcar system here in the city that will be developed over the next uh, two decades that will move people around neighborhoods in ways that they haven't. We have one of the best metro systems uh, available. We have one of the uh, increasingly best uh, bus systems. So uh, we are working hard to get people to recognize that the District of Columbia is not just the nation's capital in terms of where the seat of government is located. It is the nation's capital in terms of technology development. And I invite you while you're here, if you're from somewhere else, to, to, to get out and see the city. And if you are from somewhere else, get out and see the city. Uh, because it is a great place to be. I say that as a native Washingtonian, and I say it proudly as the mayor of the District of Columbia. Welcome and have a great week at your conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Gray. We really appreciate you being here. We know you got somewhere else. He's got to run to another uh, obligation. Thank you so much. So as you hear, there's a lot going on in the city. Uh, there's a lot going on here on campus, too. Um, I'd like to next introduce uh, someone who's going who's gonna to introduce our next speaker. And um, uh, one of our student leaders, someone who spends a great deal of time building entrepreneurship at Georgetown. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Victoria Schramm. Before I turn it over to my dad, I want to take this time to thank Jeff Reed and highlight some of the exceptional things that he has done to improve entrepreneurship here at Georgetown. Among many other things, Jeff has organized the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Club Alliance, where all clubs and organizations gather together that are affiliated with entrepreneurship and innovation on campus to promote, to promote one another and work together across campus. He has brought on a crew of great entrepreneurs and residents who judge pitch jacks, participate in roundtables, and deliver entrepreneurial chalk talks. Jeff has been an instigator in classroom development of entrepreneurship as well. He is constantly encouraging professors and students to explore entrepreneurship while at Georgetown. So thank you, Jeff, and thank you to all of the professors, student leaders, and entrepreneurs and residents who have made Georgetown entrepreneurship what it is today. I'd like to now show you a short video on Global Entrepreneurship Week, and then my dad will come out and officially kick off the event. <laughs> Mm 
Now is the time for entrepreneurship. We are committed to foster entrepreneurship and innovation in Chile. Being part of Global Entrepreneurship Week is a great opportunity for everybody to, to come together and form that voice. Global Entrepreneurship Week is a little adrenaline in the arm for the community of organizations uh, and networks that make up the entrepreneurial community to say once a year we're going to make sure we celebrate. In Denmark, we will now focus on renewed growth and entrepreneurship. We have to encourage everybody with an idea, the right motivation and the will to become an entrepreneur to pursue their dreams. Last year, over 120 fans took part all over the Netherlands. It has been the risk takers, the doers, the makers of things who have carried us up the long, rugged path toward prosperity and freedom. Global Entrepreneurship Week will be going off in almost every country in the world five years from now. Probably half a billion people in one week will think about a different career for themselves. They will see in Global Entrepreneurship Week a moment a second, a day, a lecture, a TV show, a program in which they reconceived of what they were going to do with their lives. And now I'd like to welcome my dad, Carl Strand. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for that long and gracious introduction. Um, it's the one I've been looking forward to all my life. <clears throat> um, it's a great pleasure to be here at Georgetown again. And I thought I'd talk just a little bit about the comings and goings of uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week and how it came to be. And then I want to talk about a few things that those of you who aspire to entrepreneurship, what your life is going to be like. And then I'm going to do a few Q&As. But before I do that, I'm going to show one last cartoon. So you'll know this comes to an end when I start showing movies, OK? Um, I think it's a hallmark of a bad speaker when you have to have films at the beginning and films at the end. But I'll try in between to be sort of interesting. Global Entrepreneurship Week starts here today uh, for the fourth year in a row. Now, what's remarkable about this, as far as I'm concerned, is this is the fourth year, and we have 123 countries participating. Now, let me tell how this, this got going. A few years back, uh, Gordon Brown, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer in England, which would be the equivalent of our Secretary of Treasury, called me up and he asked me to do a speech in London at the beginning of what was called, can you get this, uh, National Enterprise Week in London. And I went, it was all about entrepreneurs. Confusing thing about English, the way they use it over there. And uh, the Chancellor had used his power to, among other things, kick off many events around the, the, the country for this week. And other things he involved, were, he established, was um, a requirement that every kid who was the equivalent of a senior in high school would spend two days in a startup business in England. Now, one of the problems was they had trouble finding startup businesses in England, and that's the truth. But I, I was so taken by this, we came back to the, I came back to the United States, and we did a National Entrepreneurship Week five years ago. And it was a huge success. Um, and as we planned the next one, because we decided we'd do it, we thought we'd coordinate this with Great Britain, and we had great success. We thought we'd do this all at the same time, and then somebody had this great idea that we might try it on the world. In any event, four years ago, this was with 35 countries the first year, and as I say, this year, we're at 123 countries. So if you want to think about an entrepreneurial leverage spark, think about an idea in a telephone call that four years later is going to be articulated so that hundreds of millions of people know about this, and tens of millions of new kids, of kids, will see for the first time that starting a firm is an alternative career path. Now in the United States, this is sort of so much a part of our woodwork. And let me just suggest to you how different it is here. If you poll undergraduates in the United States, any place, but the average across all undergraduate bodies, 70% of American undergraduates want to start a firm and work for themselves at some point in their life. Let's move to France. 
82% of undergraduates in France hope to get a job in government. Now think of the difference in terms of our cultural basis here. And think of what Global Entrepreneurship Week means in a place like Malaysia um, or Senegal or Ghana, where the notion of starting a business, perhaps a growth business, is a foreign idea. In fact, we do a lot in the West to reduce the chances that, population, that people in a population will do that. For example, the way we do aid in many parts of the world siphons off the smartest people, young people, who in the United States will be out starting businesses to work for aid bureaucracies. Sometimes we stand in front of ourselves as we try to affect solutions that lead to growth. So in any event, we're delighted at the Coffin Foundation to have cooked up this idea and put the first uh, monies into it. This actually is small spending for us this year. It's about a million dollars that we use to support the worldwide uh, group of people who articulate this, coordinate this, and pull this off. And this year, we will probably see at least $70 million of cash go into the program from other sponsors, as well as untold amounts of value in in-kind contributions in all these countries around the world. In many of these countries, you'll see, as you suggest here, or as was suggested here, uh, formal uh, programs of education, television outreach, uh, classroom programs, uh, internships in companies, all kinds of varieties of competitions will be going on. The Coffin Foundation will probably give out close to 1,000 um, iPads this year around the world just to uh, stimulate competitions around the world for kids to get into this and try to think about a new life for themselves. Now, why are we doing this? An American foundation, and it's a delight to come to Georgetown to just contemplate this for a couple of reasons. First, this university is uniquely situated in the District of Columbia around all these government agencies. <clears throat> and this university, because it's a Jesuit institution, has a particular sense of mission in terms of helping other people. And in this city, and in this university, the notion of service and the expansion of human welfare is supposed to be part of the woodwork here. And if we think about ways we actually improve humankind and expand human welfare, well, there are many who would argue the other side of this, and they're all wrong. The evidence is dispositive that when free markets work in free democracies, People build businesses, and welfare expands. Now, I don't want to make a case that capitalism is without qualified qualification good. It clearly isn't. But the record is so clear that in humankind, we have never figured out another system that expands welfare better. Now, wherever you stand on this, we have to think about what the entrepreneur does in terms of scale expansion of human welfare. It's undeniable that entrepreneur does three things. I'm going to remake these points in a minute with a cartoon. But entrepreneurs are singly responsible for bringing forth the new. And by the way, with every new invention that survives the market test, human welfare expands. Think about new drugs. Think about your cell phone. Think about prosthetics for people who have disabilities or who are injured. Think about anything that survives and the rapid rate of expansion of new technologies and new products in the American economy. We are, in fact, a frontier economy. This is a concept that is just beginning to bubble up inside economics. And what does that mean? Well, one aspect of a frontier economy characterizes Americans as different consumers from the rest of the world. The reason we lead in these technological advances is because we have risk-taking consumers. People want the newest. Whether it works or not, we're not quite sure. We just want the newest. Look at the lines around uh, an Apple store three or four weeks ago. I, I was just uh, in uh, Korea with a distinguished columnist for the Financial Times who was giving forth on how, with the absence of Steve Jobs, Apple is through. And I said, geez, it's 
three days ago I was in Chicago. There's a line around the block at the Apple store, right? He was saying that um, customers resent the Apple. I haven't found that, but that's the perspective of all-knowing foreigners. The reality is Apple invents the new along with many, many other companies. And by the way, what the favor they do us is they create things that help us become wealthier or they create things in a different view that help our own individual welfare expand. Or try this one on. One of the things that happens with a new iPhone or an iPad is it is such a cognitive challenge it makes every one of us smarter. You know in the United States IQ is going up at two or three points every ten years. No one can explain this. Our school system is worse than it ever was ten years ago and ten years before that. The reason is the cognitive challenge of the technology that every single person in the United States deals with. So we're getting smarter in part because of all this technology. And the miraculous thing is, the more of it we have, the more innovation we have, the more apt and ready and equipped we are to do more innovation. This really is sort of a virtuous cycle. Now the second thing that entrepreneurs do that is so important, that has to be celebrated, and we have to focus on this right now, particularly given the state of not only the American economy, but economies around the world, is entrepreneurs create jobs. All new net job creation in the United States is in firms less than five years old. Wouldn't it be nice if people just a few blocks away in a big White House comprehended that fact? It's not the big companies that we struggle so hard to save so we can preserve jobs. Here's a little secret for you. Since taking uh, the bailout money, Chrysler and General Motors together, now remember the bailout money is premised on saving or creating jobs, are net down almost 25,000 jobs between them. Why not? Because as taxpayer, excuse me, as shareholder taxpayers of these companies, we want productivity gain. We want the value, the equity value of those firms to increase. And the way publicly traded companies work or privately held companies work is they become more valuable if you can produce more product with fewer workers. That's productivity gains. That's what they teach in this building. We are in the business school, right? That's what's taught here. Now, an entrepreneur has no capital base. Entrepreneurs have to hire people. If you have a brand new firm, what do you got? You got an idea, and to get that idea into concrete so people will buy your idea, be it a product or a service, you have to have employees. That's why all the new job generation is created by new firms. And before I move on, one of the things I want to point out, particularly if we're at Georgetown, is the importance of entrepreneurs in terms of taking human welfare in their own hands. If you create jobs for your neighbors, you do an extraordinary human service. An extraordinary human service. Think about it this way. Ewing Kaufman, who created our foundation, was born poor and he died a billionaire. Now, he was born poor. He had a father in and out of the household, just like John Rockefeller, who was born in dirt poverty in upstate New York. When you ask these guys, and if you ask uh, Bill Gates, all three said, no matter what my foundation does, the single best thing I did was create jobs for people. Now think about that. If you come from a family that lived hand to mouth, Think of the joy, the psychic return of knowing that for X number of employees and all their families, you gave them security. They could raise their kids with a sense that their kids could achieve something better, that there were savings to send your kids to school, that you actually helped families get on the road to success and move to the point where their kids might have the leisure and technology and opportunities to start their own firms. This was Ewing Kaufman's passion. I, says he, was a common person who got to do an uncommon thing, create a company. I want my money, my treasure, to be applied to doing that into the future. 
So if entrepreneurs invent the new and pre improve human welfare, then they, they hire people and improve human welfare in people they can see and identify. The third thing they do that helps human welfare is it is these firms that create new net wealth in the society. If we just have the Fortune 500, our society will grow gradually a touch more wealthy. But with the dynamics of brand new firms, we grow much wealthier. And this is really important. Really, really, really important. Because sometimes, running a foundation like I do, people somehow, a lot of undergraduates in particular, get nervous about talking about creating new firms. And they say, you know, I don't want to work in a new firm, but I want to start a nonprofit. Uh, I want to be a social entrepreneur. And while that's all well and good, the fundamentals of the economy are this. If we don't have price-taking firms being founded and the new wealth being generated in the private sector, there is no surplus wealth to support NGOs or the charitable activity of nonprofits or even the taxes to support the government as it attempts to improve human welfare. And that's just the way it is. We may reject the notion, we may not like the notion, but the reality is without this private initiative and the creation of new firms, there will be no expansion of wealth. Last point I want to make is this. Without the expansion of wealth, we can't expect the expansion of human welfare. That's as simple as it gets. We don't have wealth, we don't have surplus wealth, we don't have research that brings us new drugs. We don't have wealth, we can't, in fact, think of a government that might distribute this wealth by way of foreign aid. We don't have wealth, we can't have the dreams of how we help other people not as fortunate as us to get into circumstances where they are self-sustaining and can anticipate a better future for their children. The illustration of this is absolutely clear. In the world in the last 25 years, we've achieved something that's never been seen in history. We've reduced by 30% the number of people in the world in poverty. How do we do that? We do that through aid? Nope. We did it because the government of India and the government of China permitted entrepreneurship to break loose, permitted individuals to apply their human creativity to the invention of new businesses. They allowed, in most cases, some semblance of private property so people had an individual incentive to do more and grow, to create jobs in the private sector, and to, in fact, improve the welfare of people in China and in India who could never have otherwise been helped. It's as simple as that. And this achievement cannot be overlooked. So you can see how important entrepreneurs are. And it's once been said to me that by Muhammad Yunus, that the good news is all of us are entrepreneurs. I fundamentally believe that. Entrepreneurship is nothing less than what the Jesuit fathers thought about when they created a college. You help people understand their human dignity by letting them apply whatever gifts God gives them, creativity and innovation, in ways that will help their fellow men and women. The way we do that in concrete terms is to start new organizations, new businesses, new firms that in fact objectify ideas and bring those ideas into a world in which scale can happen and the benefits flow therefrom. Now, Muhammad Yunus offered me one other comma clause. We're all entrepreneurs, but only the lucky of us come to understand it. With that in mind, that's a summation of what our passion is at the Coffin Foundation, letting other kids around the world dream that maybe this is they, residing in their soul as the creator of a new company that fixes something in uh, Malaysia or Indonesia or Mexico or Guatemala, that they can form the economy that strengthens their company, 
and becomes the basis for freedom and democracy and individual liberty and the dignity that comes with making their own way. These observations are all going to be confirmed in, an obs in a cartoon here. And I'm through. So this is exactly three minutes. It's the most astounding cartoon you've ever seen in your entire life, OK? So watch it, and then I'll take a few questions, OK? Thank you. Entrepreneurs do three things. They birth the new in a simple way. That is to say, every type of innovation we have has largely come from people thinking innovatively, and most of them come from firms that were created to bring forth this new technology that the inventor entrepreneur thought up. The second thing they do is even much more important, and that is when new firms are started, they create jobs. This is actually quite apparent, but economists and policymakers and politicians don't get this. You know, if you're running General Electric or General Motors, your stockholders want higher productivity. They want more product coming out for less expense. It's a simple equation. It's the amount of product divided by the number of people who work in the company. And if you're the president of one of those companies, your job is to drive that number on the denominator down. You want fewer people. Well, if you start a brand new company and you're going to make something, you're going to deliver a service or a product, you got to have people, so you don't want to have more employees than necessary. But without employees, you've got nothing. So new firms hire. And in fact, the statistics from the Kauffman Foundation tell us that new firms are the place where all new hiring takes place, the net job creation. And it's not a small number. On average, new firms in the United States create about 3 million jobs a year. In fact, at the margin, that is where all the jobs are that are created in the economy that are, that are new. It's the new firms that do it. Put differently, the United States, unlike a lot of countries, has a growing population, has a growing labor force. We need 3 million brand new jobs every year. That's if everybody else kept their job. With the entry of young people, with the coming of immigrants, with people returning to the labor market, we need 3 million new jobs every year. And those jobs are the vast preponderance. Almost all of them come in firms that are less than five years old. Now, the third thing that entrepreneurs do with their new companies is they create all the new net wealth in the society. So if we didn't have new companies, the society would gradually grow in relative terms poorer. Now, we think about entrepreneurs as actually sometimes becoming very rich. We have in mind Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Sergey Brin. These guys get very, very wealthy. But in fact, the real wealth goes into the society. It's estimated that the people who start these firms take a fraction, in some cases less than a percent, of all the new net wealth that their companies generate for the society. Think about what Bill Gates did with Microsoft. Now, he made a fortune for himself, tens of billions of dollars. But he's made every one of us richer in economic terms. We are all much better off. So these are all the things that entrepreneurs do. They keep pushing the innovative, they push the new, they make jobs for people, and they make wealth for the society. America and the world will, as long as human beings walk this planet, need innovators, need inventors, need entrepreneurs. Just a little note, we found this company in Chicago who does that. That's not my hand. That's my voice. And um, in the last uh, three months, um, the order book has multiplied seven times. So if you could watch that and they like it and they want to copy it. Uh, I have time for uh, one or two questions. And then um, I'll hang around for the uh, reception if anybody wants to put tougher questions to me or unanswerable questions. My daughter cannot ask a question in public. <laughs> Sit tight. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, thank you. My name is Jess Sadik. I'm the founder and CEO of DownForLunch.com. Down for it's Lunch? Down for Lunch with the number four, dot com. Um, it's a social networking website for professionals. We connect professionals during workday breaks to pursue career and business opportunities. So if you're a student in this room who's thinking about going into a particular industry um, or you're set on an industry, get Down for Lunch with someone in that industry because it could lead to a job or an, 
a um, in internship. The question I have for you is, um, there's a lot of talk about um, entrepreneurship in Washington now, a lot of new energy. And I was curious about, at least that's my take, and I've yeah. been living here for about 15 years. Yeah. Um, but still, people say, go west. You know, there was a special on CNN last night on the Black in America program about um, African Americans going out west to pursue their startup endeavors. It was a great uh, program. If you have time, look it up. Um, so my question for you is, what are maybe two or three uh, factors that need to be present in Washington for it to grow like it did out west? You know, I think of risk. I think of capital. What are tops on your list? Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, First of all, I remember that I'm coming to you from Kansas City. So anything that sounds like go west, I like the sound of that, OK? Because out there, we look back here, and this is the first of the things I'd speak about. We look back here. I can't come to the District of Columbia anymore. Now, I was trained as an economist, so this is very weird. But I look at this whole city as the enormous burden the rest of all the cities in America have to, have to pay, right? And you can chuckle about that. But there are no big buildings like this in other cities. Uh, these are cities, these, this is a city that's chock full of big buildings with people who work because I work. We pay taxes to keep this going. So this is the city where it's more likely that kids go to high school and think about a job for the government. And that's a cultural issue that is of enormous consequence. Um, I spent la yesterday working on a paper around the question of how do you restart the Irish economy. And the very first issue is how do you change the culture so that people actually believe that, that a different future can be made. And it's more difficult in Ireland because they, they actually operate under the burden of Brussels. So many of their decisions can't even be made by them. So their problem is much worse. So in a sense, uh, just to joke about this for a minute, for not to be too jokey about this, think of all the human capital in this city. Fantastic. This is a magnet for talent. Now just think if we could bust up the executive departments and send them out into America. So the Department of Transportation went to Omaha. And the Department of Agriculture went to Minneapolis. Okay? And the city shrunk and all the rent taking stopped. The people who lived here would become more entrepreneurial right away. And I bet all the people who work for the federal government went into these other cities and saw how they operate and get lots more innovative right away. Kansas City is a great example. None of you think much of Kansas City. You think it's a cow town out there, cowboys, barbecue, right? It's an amazing city entrepreneurially. That's where Garmin exists. And the two men who created Garmin are at their desks every day. Henry Block walks the streets of H&R Block. Jim Stowers, who created American Century, walks the street. Barnett Helsberg walks the street. We see entrepreneurs. I know them. We touch them. They're around us every day. Okay. Now, who are the entrepreneurs here? When I'm not living in Kansas City, I'm living in Baltimore. All right? And in Baltimore, if you stop people on the street and say, who are this city's entrepreneurs? They might name Kevin Plank. And that's where it stops. You stop somebody on the street in Kansas City, they'll tell you the names of 10 or 20 people starting firms. Now, when I said, who are the entrepreneurs here? Somebody raised their hand. That's right, OK? But you're not conceiving of yourself as a Washingtonian who's an entrepreneur. You're conceiving yourself, maybe because you go here and you're a sophisticated citizen of the world. You're just going to deal with that market out there, OK? So it, it's a huge cultural thing that has to be broken. Um, because this is the only question I'm going to take, I'll just answer a couple other things about this in terms of Washington. You're right. I'm watching the word entrepreneur be used around here all the time. Now, as the president of Kauffman Foundation, I think I should be doing backflips. It's the only problem. When I come here and talk to people about it, I watch a registration in their face that says they don't get it. So I go to the Hill, uh, where I was, or will be on Wednesday, and I talk to a congressman, you know what they're saying? I say, I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship. They say, I know all about small business. Okay. If you go to the State Department, where I was today, and talk to them about our outbound message, they say, yes, we know all about small and medium enterprise. And I put the brakes on. And I say, small and medium enterprise is the language of Brussels. OK? 
okay? It's kind of funny, isn't it? But you know what, what words, Justice Holmes tells us, are the skin of ideas. And you know what our government's saying when I hear it? Aren't those businesses cute? There are big businesses, and then there's all this sort of static around the edges. And we'll pay attention to them when they become Microsoft or Apple. Aren't they cute? We need them. Small and medium enterprise. Small and medium enterprise is a German concept. It's the Mittelstadt. We have, have middle-sized companies that do stuff for our big companies. And when they get big enough, the state will visit you and say, look at little Mittelstadt company. Siemens wants to buy you. And the government condones that. We don't have that in the United States. Or if they're not sort of saying with the register of this side, yeah, I got it, it's small business. They're saying, I know all about venture capital. The venture capital lobby is big in Washington, but it's not that important. Of the 500 fastest growing firms in the United States, about 14% ever had venture capital. It's not that important. So we make policy around two visions that are just wrong, in a sense, really wrong. So there you have it. You want a policy recommendation? This is what mine would be, okay? If an entrepreneur starts a business, two different twists. One will kill President DeJoya, but maybe he's not here and it won't kill him. He won't hear it. But take this message back, okay? The first is the government ought to say, if you're a brand new business, guess what? There's no taxes and there's no regulation for the first two or three years. You don't even count, okay? When you get big enough, we'll tune in and check you out and see, okay? A friend of mine started a business in New York. Four months into his business, he gets a notice that he's fined $40,000 for not complying, one person, with the workers' compensation statutes, okay? Welcome to New York, a business-friendly environment. Give me a break. The other thing I might do is, you know, this is so important, and by the way, it's so important to the future of a university, because entrepreneurs sometimes get rich and they remember where it was that Professor Reed taught them all they needed to know to become a successful entrepreneur, okay? How about if at year five, you came back to Georgetown and said, guess what? I'm an entrepreneur, I have a new company, and at year five, I now employ 15 people or 20 people who are not family members. That's my success. And the university said, terrific. Here's four years of tuition back. You've done just what you should do. We encourage that, okay? Think of the signal that would send. Signal from government, start this way. Signal from the university, we applaud what you do, okay? Two last points. One is, how about in Washington, get this bureaucratic clod kludgy talk, right? Could we just change the name? Think of a few words. Small Business Administration, we baptize it the New Business Administration. Isn't that what America's about? All small businesses want to be big businesses. And the last thing, here's a great idea, I think. You know, all of you who applied here had to write an essay. I think you did. Um, I can't remember. Did I write this essay for you? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> On, um, you know, your engagement in social activity. What do you call it? Work release. No, that's in prison. What do you call it? Um, your community service, that's it. Community service, required in a lot of places, right? You have to write these essays on your community service. How about on the Common App, everybody had to write an essay on a business they started or hoped to start. Well, instead of kids overworking the woods by my house in their community service, right? They were down there trying to figure out how to sell firewood, maybe, okay? They could write about why it is they thought an entrepreneur did something that was useful to the society, and maybe if they don't think they do, they're gonna invent a type of firm that actually does something useful for the society. So those are four answers in addition to my observation that went on too long and you are very welcome for that fantastic adver advertisement you got in there for the name of your firm, okay? Thank you all very much.
So uh, I've, I've seen Carl before. I, I've never seen him answer one, five or six questions with only one being asked, but, uh, but he definitely loves to, to converse, so please come find him at the reception. Uh, this concludes, or almost concludes, the formal part of our program. We are going to have an official kickoff ceremony here and uh, maybe a drum roll. We have the gong. Uh, and, I, and notwithstanding what Victoria said earlier, there are actually a whole bunch of people here that are doing all the entrepreneurship stuff. And I'd like to invite our entrepreneurs in residence, our, some of our student entrepreneurship leaders, our entrepreneurship faculty to come up here and join us. Also, Peter Stewart from DC Entrepreneurship Week. And uh, we're going to officially ring the gong to kick off Entrepreneurship Week. So. You guys come on up and uh, help us do that. We need a longer, yeah, we all need hard hats. Uh, while we're doing this, you guys are welcome to stick around or you can take off and head to the reception upstairs. There's food and drinks and uh, we're gonna continue the conversation in the Fisher Colloquium on the fourth floor. So uh, come on up, Smithwood, I see you. Don't be afraid, any other entrepreneurship faculty out there, come on down, all right. All right. <laughs>